I'm Jesse Yost with Comscope Ruckus. Today we're going to take a look inside Ruckus Cloud at the advanced WLAN configurations and discuss how changes made to these settings impact clients in your environment. Here we are back again in my Ruckus Cloud instance. Today we're going to take a look at the advanced wireless network configurations available in Ruckus Cloud. We're gonna go through each one of these and kind of point out some of the issues they could resolve if you enable them or things to be aware of if you enable them. Let's get started uh, by going over to wireless networks. We're gonna choose my wireless network, go into edit network, and then click on the advanced tab. The first couple of settings here we've already discussed in previous Ruckus Cloud videos. So I'm gonna jump right down to the enable load balancing checkboxes. Both of these settings are inherited from the venue and are enabled by default, but can be overridden on a per WLAN basis. The first option here to enable load balancing between 2.4 and 5 GHz radios will look to take client connections that are incoming and distribute them across all available bands. So you may have a 5 GHz capable client that is using 2.4 because load balancing has determined that uh, the 2.4 GHz uh, radio chain is underutilized. Now, in other Ruckus products, uh, Smart Zone and Ruckus Unleashed, there has been configurable percentages that you could apply to each one of these to make sure that a radio band uh, never got more than, let's say, 25% of the client load. Um, that is not currently a feature that is in the Ruckus Cloud UI. So if there is a scenario where you want to maximize the 5 gigahertz capabilities on your WLAN, you may look to actually disable load balancing between these radio chains so that the clients can make the decision completely themselves. The second option here to enable load balancing between APs will look to distribute client connection across APs that are underutilized in your environment. So if you have a WLAN that is serviced by multiple APs and one of those APs is underutilized but is still a good match for RSSI and SNR for the client, it may look to push that uh, client over to help improve the performance of your WLAN. Moving down to access control, uh, device connection policies will allow you to uh, enable or block a particular client from accessing a WLAN based on MAC address. Uh, traffic policies will allow you to specify IPv4 source destination addresses, as well as protocols to allow or block access to those. You can also specify device or OS access policies, um, and you can also assign those specific devices to uh, a VLAN or you can rate limit those. So maybe you have Android tablets in your network that you wanna make sure are on a specific VLAN. Uh, you, could, you could set that access policy here and application access policies. So if you have an application that you wanna block from your WLAN or you wanna rate limit the specific application as well, uh, it's taken up too much bandwidth, you can, you can certainly do that uh, on, on the access policy for applications as well. If you have any of these access control policies enabled for your WLAN, it's important to understand how they're functioning so that you know what the expected outcome is from your clients. So if you have one enabled and you have the policy listed, you can choose edit to get more information about it. So you can see here that I've got a uh, Chrome OS policy that is uh, taking any of my Chrome OS devices that come in and it is allowing them to join the network, but it is putting them on VLAN 10 and it is giving them a uh, limit on their downlink connection. So if this uh, customer or a, a Chrome OS user were to call in and, and tell me that the connectivity was was slow, uh, we'd have to figure out what they were doing, but it might be a, a symptomatic of the fact that we are limiting their download uh, capabilities from this WLAN. The next option here is DNS proxy. And typically when we talk about DNS proxies, we're talking about basically a DNS cache so that an AP can offload DNS lookups and maybe respond quicker and add a performance benefit. But with this DNS proxy, what we're actually doing is we're allowing the AP to respond to a DNS query with a custom IP address that we specify. So if you see this enabled um, on your network, um, the, DN, the domain name that is listed, uh, if queried from, from your WLAN, will be, res, uh, will be actually translated in the IP address that the DNS proxy rule specifies. Typically, you'll see this in walled garden scenarios where you have multiple domain names that need to touch maybe the same or overlapping IP address services. 
Scrolling down, we can see that Wi-Fi calling is enabled on this WLAN. This is typically not enabled by default, but once it is enabled, you can create additional profiles to identify the uh, traffic based on your Wi-Fi calling. So as you can see here, I have three profiles that have been created, one for each of the major US uh, carriers. So any phones that are on my network, on my WLAN, if they're making uh, Wi-Fi calls in a time of congestion, their uh, traffic is gonna be tagged with QoS Priority Voice, which should help them maintain their connections uh, in a congested environment. The next setting, client isolation, is also disabled by default. And once enabled, it allows members of the WLAN to only communicate with their gateway. So if you have multiple users on this network, they will not be able to communicate with each other, which is something that's typically enabled for security in guest WLANs and public WLANs. So once enabled, you can additionally specify which types of traffic uh, based on packet class um, are isolated. Is it just unicast traffic that you want to isolate or do you also want to do multicast or do you want to do both unicast and multicast traffic? There's also a setting that, that opens up if you enable client isolation for VRRP and HSRP support. So this is virtual router redundancy protocol and hot standby routing protocol. Um, as we said, the clients are only able to access the gateway address, um, but if you're using either one of these protocols, VRRP or HSRP, there could be secondary gateways or virtual IPs that need to be in communication so that the clients can reach their gateway. So enabling this will allow users in those types of environments to also be able to communicate. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off isolation for this WLAN, and we're gonna talk about anti-spoofing. So anti-spoofing is a security protection to protect against uh, people that are trying to do brute force ARP requests or DHCP requests. It's gonna limit the amount of requests that come in as to not deny the service on the WLAN. Uh, do note that when turning on anti-spoofing, it does force this WLAN to use DHCP, meaning if you have a static address defined on your client, you're not gonna be able to connect and it's gonna require you to use the Ruckus uh, Cloud DHCP services on this WLAN. Uh, the next option is hide SSID, which hides this SSID from broadcast. Uh, it can still be seen in the 802.11 protocol, but it's not going to publicly advertise itself in your device. You're gonna have to just name the device itself. And typically uh, it's not worth disabling because if somebody wants to find it, they, they absolutely can't. The next setting we're gonna talk about is enable OFDM only. So this is disabled by default and when it is enabled for your WLAN, it prevents 802.11 be capable only clients from connecting. So this is a performance benefit because I'm restricting lesser capability clients from joining and connecting to my WLAN. So this, if this is enabled and you have uh, older clients, you need to be aware of how many you have. Maybe you have to spin up another WLAN that uh, allows these clients. Um, but in this particular WLAN, I have excluded them um, and there's a performance benefit for me in doing so. The BSS min rate defines the minimum rate at which a client must be able to establish in order to connect to the WLAN. So typically this is set to none, but for my WLAN, I have specified 24 megabits per second. So any client joining in needs to be capable of at least that data throughput in order to join. One thing that you need to be aware of is that clients that aren't able to establish that data rate will not be served by this WLAN. Alternately, if a client is being served by the WLAN and their data rate drops below, they will be disconnected and they will look to roam rather than hanging on to the uh, lower data rate speeds. So you need to be aware of your least capable client when you're setting any of these settings, but these are performance impacting. So uh, I'm making sure that my clients are all able to at least connect at this speed, which should impact and improve airtime utilization. 802.11k neighbor reports is enabled by default for the WLAN and allow APs to share with each other their capabilities and build a neighbor list. Clients looking to roam will obtain the neighbor list to make a good decision about their potential roam destinations. 802.11r fast BSS transition or FT roaming is not enabled by default, but once enabled, it allows clients to maintain their session authentication when roaming. This is particularly helpful in environments that use 802.1x authentication for their clients. So with this enabled, clients that are connected with an 802.1x authentication session won't have to re-authenticate when roaming. 
So we can see the client inactivity timeout here. I have configured for 20,000 seconds, which is about five and a half hours. Um, by default, this is set to 120 seconds. And what I found is when leaving it as the default, what I would typically see in the log is that the client would disconnect due to an activity timeout and then immediately connect back into the WLAN. And this would happen over and over and over and over. So in my home environment, I've increased this number to 20,000 to reduce the impact on the management of that session. So I'm not seeing that as frequently in your environment. You may have a need to set that lower, but 20,000 uh, uh, five and a half hours is fine for me based on the rest of the configurations in my network. Scrolling down, we can see the next option or next setting is directed multicast to broadcast threshold. So what this number here uh, by default is set to five. And this means that the AP is going to convert multicast and broadcast to unicast to improve airtime utilization and performance unless there are more than five clients on the radio. Once there are more than five clients, it will not convert that back over to unicast. So we don't recommend setting this number higher than five because it can negatively impact performance on the APs. Moving down to airtime decongestion, I do have that enabled here. That is disabled by default. And actually, if you'll note, uh, if you turn it off, you actually are able to set a join RSSI threshold. When you enable airtime decongestion, you forfeit the ability to be able to set a join RSSI threshold for the WLAN. Airtime decongestion is super helpful in dense environments where you have a lot of APs and a lot of clients. What this is doing is it's cutting down on management frame responses. So if you can imagine there is an imaginary circle around your AP that is basically a signal to noise ratio threshold it's only going to be responding to probe requests for clients that are meeting that SNR threshold. So rather than every AP that has the ability to hear a client uh, making a request, only the AP that matches the signal to noise threshold is going to respond. So it's really going to cut down on those management frames. Again, if we disable airtime decongestion on this WLAN, we are able to set a join RSSI threshold. So what this means is that we are able to specify the signal level at which a client must meet to be able to join our WLAN. So this makes it so weak signals um, are just ignored. We don't even respond to those. They have to at least meet this RSSI threshold to join. The next setting here, transient client management. This is disabled by default. If we enable this, we are basically setting a wait timer that clients must wait before they can join our network. So we might wanna use this if we were a restaurant and a busy airport terminal, and we didn't want just everybody walking through the terminal to associate to our network. We would enable this and we would set our uh, join wait time, our join wait threshold, and they would have to wait 30 seconds before our AP would start responding to them. So people that are just walking by, you know, hopefully they can do it in 30 seconds. We might need to adjust this. You could take this to 60, but um, basically you're gonna refuse them service unless they are still around after 60 or 30 seconds, whatever you set. This is gonna greatly reduce the amount of management traffic and the associations on the AP. The last setting here is the optimized connectivity experience or OCE. Now, if we this is disabled by default, and if we enable it, we can see kind of that we have a probe response delay and a uh, RSSI based association rejection uh, based off of the RSSI threshold. So this kind of is similar to the RSSI threshold that you can set on the WLAN, but uh, OCE is something that is required to be supported on both the AP and the client. So this is actually running protocol 802.11ai, um, and it, it does function a little bit differently. It needs the support on both sides. Um, this will actually uh, set the probe response interval here and set them to a broadcast probe response versus a unicast probe response. So basically, this is going to cut down on management traffic. And if you, um, if your, if your client doesn't meet this association or reassociation threshold, it will be rejected. So again, this one needs to be supported on both the client and the AP to take advantage of this. And that's all we have for this one. We just wanted to get in here and explain the advanced WLAN configurations within Ruckus Cloud and talk to you guys about how they may help or hurt clients in your environment. We hope you can join us next time.